This podcast is brought to you by the School of Advanced Study, University of London. All of our podcasts are available from our website, www.sas.ac.uk. Thank you very much for foremost, I would like to thank you very much for Peter and Claudia for the invitation and the warm welcome and friendly introduction. A great many things have been said about Walter Benjamin, Walter Benjamin, a lot of things about Abi Warburg and up till now quite a few things about the intellectual relationship. Therefore it has become difficult to approach the subject unbiased and unintimidated by the argument of the literature. My focus so has slightly shifted compared with the rather generalizing title in the announcement. I am now concentrating less on the basics but prefer to retreat a step behind the standard works of colleagues like Cornelia Zumbusch, Matthew Rampley and others by turning away from the big picture towards the details. With this and by means of the presented material I hope to be able to contribute illuminating particulars to the discussion about the relations of Warburg to Benjamin and vice versa. These relations personally failed in their day as we all know but have been most fertile for us the late readers through the reception. Two extreme outsiders of their individual discipline, art history on the one side, literary history and philosophy on the other, who have not only each on their own made history of their discipline and of science by means of their speeches and paradigms, but have without prior, prior agreement like twins decidedly made sure to broach and to lift research and cultural studies to the academic throne. The cultural turn, that is the turn of the humanities interdisciplinary integrative concept of culture has found its main stimulators and advocates, at least in Germany, since around 1980 in Benjamin and Warburg. In their day, it's unnecessary to talk about it, they both represented modern art history or literary history inspired by cultural studies. The Kulturwissenschaftliche Bibliothek Warburg in Hamburg virtually was the flagship of this idea and movement. No wonder that Benjamin felt attracted to this place. To consider objects, artifacts as material and symbolic practices and not mere products of the spirit is one of the main ideas of this cultural turn. Warburg and Benjamin prepared the ground in various ways. With regard to an abundance of new subjects, alternative questioning and methods and not with a bold look from the present to the past as well as the passion for language as a main heuristic agency of science. Besides both independent scholars, independent, who are separated by one generation, also contributed significantly to the second turn, influencing the present, the iconic or pictorial turn which has dominated discourse in our disciplines since the beginning of the 1990s. For Warburg who in 1917 identified himself explicitly as historian of the image, this doesn't have to be proven anymore. For Benjamin it may be proven in concreto at a point in time when the share of his occupation with artistic and cultural images of any provenance and far away from metaphors and dialectic images will have been documented to the ex entire extent. At the moment we cannot consider more than the tip of the iceberg of his concrete dealing with the diverse pictorial media and medial images, not least on a on account of a publication policy focusing on philology. But now in media threads, on the basis of two concrete historic cultural objects, both more trivial than sublime, but highly estimated and analyzed by Warburg as well as Benjamin, I would like to explain the mutual affinity on the subject, but also some differences in their respective methodological approaches. Chapter 1. From an astrological point of view, considering the dates and circumstances, we could speak of a favor favorable constellation for the object in question and the people related to it, perhaps 
even of a royal conjunction, as Warburg might have put it. On July 16, 1927, Walter Benjamin sent his finished version of a short essay with the title Stamp Shop Briefmarkenhandel Handlung or Stamp Store from Paris to Siegfried Krakauer, the feuilleton editor of the Frankfurter Zeitung, asking him to publish the text in his newspaper. Barely a month later, on August 9th, the article came out on the front page of this edition and was, and was also to appear in book form one year later in Benjamin's aphorism collection One Way Street. In a draft of this concise cultural history of the postage stamp and its iconographic, iconographic physiognomy, it is stated stamp is the greatest discovery of the 19th century. With it, world history wanders into the 19th century. It creates a mosaic. End of quote. And at another point, which we see there marked up here, Benjamin argues, stamp albums are magic reference books. The huge numbers of monarchs and palaces of animals and allegories and states are recorded in them. Postal traffic depends on the harmony of these numbers as the motions of the planets depend on the harmony of the celestial numbers." End of quote. The same, the very same day that Benjamin posted his manuscript at the post office, a lecture event with the philosopher Erich Rothager took place in far away Hamburg at the Kulturwissenschaftliche Bibliothek, complemented by a paper of the host Warburg himself on the subject of current political iconography. In his contribution, Warburg discusses the self-dramatization of Benito Mussolini and the Italian fascism, not least by bringing up contemporary stamps, explaining with their help not only the lion as attribute of authority and power, but also the tradition of the motive of the antique fasces, as well as the contemporary brutalized, as he terms it, use of, fas of, it, of the fasces. Warburg's observations are remarkable in two ways. For one thing, he deals very concretely with the contemporary image culture, culture for the first time since the days of the First World War. And secondly, he draws on his passion for the stamp, which he developed very early in his life, his passion for the stamp. Looking back, Warburg observed Philet passion. Quote, being a keen collector since boyhood, fascinated by the microcosmic element, a miniature world showing abundance but at the same time revealing the fight of the image forming powers. End of quote. Before Warburg would occupy himself with advertising and advertisements and other ephemera, he turned towards the stamp as a significant image vehicle or a vehicle of the image built vehicle of modern age. He had already planned an art history of the stamp during the years before the First World War and had sent a related request to the Leipzig-based publishing company Teubner. The publisher, however, Warburg reported, was not able at that time to imagine it an evening filling topic. When Taking up the project again in another form in the mid-twenties, he wrote, Warburg wrote down as main idea the following principle, quote, when all documents are lost, a complete stamp album is sufficient to reconstruct the culture of the world during the technical age, end of quote. Consequently, he imagined for the program of his own research library, Quote, if the KBB, Kulturwissenschaftliche Bibliothek Warburg, is a museum for history and psychology of the cosmic orientation, the stamp belongs there, since it magically gifts wings to the word, separates it from the carrier, and con conveys it to a third party. End of quote. In a second paper on stamps, which Warburg gave on the Saturday, during the same week in which the before-mentioned article by Benjamin had been published on the Tuesday in the Frankfurt 
oder Zeitung, the scholar expressed this idea in concrete terms. Following a guest lecture of the Reichskunstrat, Minister of Cultural uh, Affairs of the State, Edwin Rietzlob, who had talked about the stamp as a cultural document, Warburg gave a lecture on the function of the stamp image in the spiritual traffic of the world. And he pushed every button of old and new media, original drawings, illustrated books, charts, uh, plates, slides, and epidioscope images that his library offered in order to instruct the audience on the diversity of creative and expressive possibilities of these miniature images and their historical descent. The newspaper Hamburger Nachrichten wrote the following about the event. Quote, by means of a great number of stamp groups presented on slides, Professor Warburg unfurled a brilliant and highly amusing state psychology of various countries as it may be deduced from the sometimes brusque, sometimes abstract or godlike and sometimes assiduously advertising representation of the heads of state domestic products or allegories. End of quote. Barbados and Germania stems were reviewed as well as critically commented which testified Warburg's idea of the culture of stems as an imagery of world traffic, Weltverkehr. Benjamin, similarly enthusiastic as Warburg, partly using the same words, for example, world traffic, Weltverkehr, equally speaks of the stem as a graphic cellular tissue, ein grafisches Zellengewebe and of the collective album as an atlas of mindscape, Ideenwelt. Here uh, to show you some examples of the stems v uh, Benjamin quoted in his article, a student of mine has put them uh, together, both them and put them together to show it uh, to you. Stems are to him the visiting cards that the great states leave in a child's room a sentence by Benjamin. They are, quote, the real retirement homes for the jaded heraldic creatures. The complete genealogy of humanity has found its way onto letters. Lions, giraffes, ostriches, eagles encounter Greek gods, wild wood people bearing maces and genius with a halo of world traffic. A full-necked peasant opens his eyes in wonderment to the fairy world into which Lenin has conjured him. He had not thought of this when he overthrew the Tsar." End of quote. Benjamin's perspective is rather essayistic corresponding to the chosen publication form, the Feuilleton of the Frankfurter Zeitung, whereas Warburg's view is significantly more scientific and political. Benjamin is rather interested in the aesthetic and formal phenomena in this article, whereas Warburg focuses on iconographic and journalistic elements. Nonetheless, Benjamin as well is aware of the function of the stamps as political emblems or symbols. By the way, Warburg uh, uh, mentions Lenin in his uh, context, uh, lecture context too, and calls him a brief uh, stamp hero, Briefmarkenheld. Whereas Warburg concretely and practically puts himself out for a reform of the design of the German postage stamp, you all do know, in between this uh, uh, draft of, an, uh, of a stamp he ordered by the uh, German artist uh, Strohmeyer. On the, on the other side you see from May or April 29, 1929, some stamps, Warburg's, uh, Benjamin's son, Stefan, uh, drew, drew and uh, Benjamin put them into his notes as a cut off. Uh, he put them and he, in, he was then, 1929, 11 years old and he was uh, very uh, uh, interested in stamps, his son and Benjamin discussed with his son, as we know from his notes, uh, all the details of uh, producing and using uh, stamp images. It is possible that Benjamin's ears were burning in Paris 
while the Bibliothèque Farber concerned itself politically and scientifically with the stamp and he himself rendered homage to it by means of aphoristic miniatures containing to some extent closely related observations and arguments. It seems rather unlikely that he would have noticed the short reports about the events at the Kulturwissenschaftliche Bibliothek that were published in both regional newspapers in the French capital. Vice versa, it cannot be completely excluded that Warburg read Benjamin's article in the Frankfurter Zeitung, but so far no proof has been found. Therefore, it seems that the mutual passion for the stamp as graphic object is still for the most part disregarded as object of art historical research, as well as the temporal coincidence of the happenings has stayed concealed to both protagonists. Looking back, the striking parallelism of both positions may be easily reconstructed thanks to the excellent documentation which were particularly taken care of by Warburg in the form of diary and archive. The relations with which we are confronted are almost complementary to each other. Benjamin's ideas are left as published text as well as some drafts, but there are no images. Whereas Warburg's approach is testified almost exclusively in his uh, panels as of the Atlas, as well as a few notes on the lecture which he gave, almost without notes, as we uh, do now. Yet it is obvious that we cannot just exchange Benjamin's text with Warburg's images and vice versa. But there remains a scenario of an elective affinity regarding cultural phenomena that are or were not the order of the day according to general understanding. They were too inconspicuous, too unimportant, but all the same or even for this reason suitable as indicators and documents for the state of the world if one knows how to decipher their emblems, national emblems and symbols, be it on the political or on the phenomenological level. Nonetheless, I do not have intended to level out the distances and differences of the two cultural historians. Warburg and Benjamin each certainly had their own head and after all the will to know more about the other was only conditional. It is one-sided. Benjamin wanted to become acquainted with the Institute or Warburg himself. However, from the perspective and distance of posterity, which is not least aware of the unusual parallels of their uh, reception, it is surprising to discover how close these two dioscuri of contemporary cultural discourse came in their works in terms of subject and questioning, partially also of methods and results without ever having met in person. Chapter 2. With a second example from another field of cultural historical reflection, I would like to consolidate by means of arguments the observations of the, on the intellectual twin figure of the two cultural historians of the Weimar Republic. On October 31st, 1925, the Berliner Illustrierte published an almost full-page photography as teaser, showing the close-up of three young German artists under the caption Dichter, Kinder, Poets, Children, all of them coming from prominent families, besides Erika and Klaus Mann, Pamela Wiedekind made an appearance wearing a stage costume. What brought photo and teaser about was the topicality, namely the premiere of a theatre piece by Klaus Mann, the Hamburger Kammerspiele directed by Gustav Grünkens. The writer, the writer Friedrich Burschel made short work of this issue of the Berlin Weekly some days later in the periodical Literarische Welt, as Walter Benjamin reports in his gloss, Nichts gegen die Illustrierte, nothing against the magazine, Nichts gegen die Illustrierte. There it is stated that Borschel castigated the concept and layout of the concerned issue of the Illustrierte passing in his memorial article at the occasion of the centenary of Jean Paul's death. Because the front page rendered homage to the adolescent poet's children with a close-up picture, whereas the poet Jean Paul which he loves, had been shunted to the back page of the magazine in, as Burschel writes, in a consequentially downscaled representation and thus to the hindmost corner, though, further quote, not without being confronted 
even here on this last page with a narrow-minded hero of an obscure trial, a clairvoyant, which you see on the uh, left, with two whores, prostituierte, dressed up to the hilt in feathers and fur and two cats and a monkey rather than on no account whatever with the creatures that the poet loved so much with the most pathetic fondness such as squirrels, dogs, songbirds and butterflies which would have been feasible just as well." End of quote. Following these remarks, Benjamin at first mocks a little bit the author and his observations and expectations that seem out, the, out of date before immediately continuing with the reflections on the status and state of contemporary illustrated popular press. Quote, uh, to whom it is not obvious that under the given circumstances of democratic journalism something better than the Berliner Illustrated does not exist on the Western European continent. That is so superlatively interesting only due to its accuracy, weakly consolidating the vi viciously dispersed attention, die zerstreute Aufmerksamkeit, of the bank clerk, the secretaries and the fitter in a curved mirror. This documentary character in it is its power and at the same time its legitimization. What could be more boring than a close-up head of Jean Paul on the front page of the magazine? It is only interesting as long as his head stays small. To show things in the aura of their topicality is worth more and is more fertile, if indirect, than boasting with the, when it comes down to it, very narrow-minded ideas of popular education. If the cool and shady topicality of these images pages, image pages is not due to a hundred percent to the speculation of the lowermost instincts as the other and cheaper paper meant die Woche, but to fifty percent to its technical accuracy, it should have gained the right to be observed with the most benevolent neutrality by the man of letters whom collaboration on it, God knows, does befit. End of quote. Benjamin justifies what his colleague abuses as foolish horseplay on the one hand with regard to the relations of production of the prevailing media landscape and on the other hand considering the perception practices of the readers whose dispersed attention, zerstreute Aufmerksamkeit as perceptual form had become their second nature. The Berliner Illustrated published by Ulstein achieves something and is distinguished from the cheap competition of the magazine Die Woche sort of yellow press published by Charles, by the fact that it strives at least at 50 percent to attain a level that deserves credit. Benjamin's article was never published, whether he withdrew it or if it was rejected remains unknown up to now. And the cor correlation at hand, the debate about the graphic and thematic quadlibet on the back page of the magazine deserves attention. Four years before Warburg crusades against the arbitrariness and improvidence of the editorial office and the graphic designer responsible for the layout of the Hamburger Fremdenblatt. At uh, the occasion of a PhD celebration, the so-called Doctor Fire, July 30, 1929, Benjamin rather rallies to the project of a seemingly random and mortally pictorial design. In his serious and equally humorous speech, Warburg comments elaborately on the current illustrated insert of the Hamburger Fremdenblatt published the day before. In short steps, he analyzes the front page of the paper with its random collection of images from all over the world and criticizes the tacky and crude compilation. According to Warburg's sport reports, were blended disrespectfully with pictures of a procession of the Pope in such a way that suddenly the amusing hoc meum corpus est of the prize-winning swimmer were displayed next to the tragical hoc est corpus meum of the Christian Eucharist without anyone protesting against this thoughtlessness. It would not least be the aim of the KBW as a collector for historic exchange movements to foster a firm and high principled understanding for the word of the word and the image. Warburg's protest against the image salat in German, Salat is an anagram of Atlas, can be regarded as example for this. Without further ado, the incriminated page from the Fremdenblatt is incorporated in toto into the Atlas on panel 79, uh, plate 79, as counter model to his own practice of montage that looks very similar at first glance. As similar as the layout concept of the 
of the plate from the illustrated atlas and the magazine may seem the differences and divergences of course immediately become evident when asking for substance and coherence. Warburg's and Benjamin's positions are obviously diametrically opposed regarding the question of layout. On one side the intellectual generously calling for benevolent neutrality who is already glad about the fact that not everything is sacrificed to the lowermost instincts. On the other side the historian Warburg being indeed also in favor of popular education who attacks the tabloid press because it acts carelessly and without scruples in order to attract attention with the reading public no matter what the cost. However, if we uh, observe the two pages of the concerned magazines more closely, it quickly becomes clear that the Berlin magazine represent, presents the chaos of the content. It has to report about a clairvoyant, a photo of animals with the caption Freunde, friends, the portrait of a poet with the simple comment Jean Paul, centenary of the poet, as well as two interesting valuable fur costumes from the review from A to Z at the Komische Oper in Berlin in a composed and strictly symmetrical order. The portrait medallions are placed right right and left on top of the page just like eyes and frame the upright rectangle acute photo of the monkey and the two cats while the animal photo with the cut chair legs leads over to the two costume photos below. We might almost be tempted to assume that the graphic designer wanted to create a kind of graphic hybrid face on the one hand and on the other wanted, uh, hand wanted to thematically conjoin the fur costumes of the two revenue girls turning their backs on each other with the furs of the animals by slightly interleaving the three portrait formats. Four years later in the Hamburger Fremdenblatt the concentration of information and the variability of shapes have significantly increased. Small and large formats in various extensions alternate with medallions and the captions are joined to the individual photos. There is no feature article while the images stand more strongly for themselves and independently tell their stories. The coherence is created by the letter of the magazine's name at the upper margin arranged in a segmental arch and accompanied by a veduta. The license for the colorful div diversity of the panorama of the day is provided by the title of the insert Rundschau im Bilder panorama in images. The conjunction of some of the images by overlapping contributes to a graphical densification and dynamization, thus causing the viewer's eye to jump to and fro in nervous saccades like a ball in a pinball machine. In the case of the probe having at his side a scantily dressed Hamburg swimmer, this is, as Warburg judged rightly, a substantially respectless faux pas, which is accentuated again by the caption which states, quote, for the first time since 1870, the Pope steps on St. Peter's Square. He carries in front of him the Holy of Holies. In the background, the box with diplomats, photo Felici. This world famous event is answered on the opposite side by the sober report from local sports, 4,000 meter Elbe swimming contest, Winner Walter Meyer, Wandsbecker Schwimmverein of 1902, Photo Schweig, end of quote. From an art historical point of view, it can be remarked that the pillared, pillared Hamburg image mix also displays a strategy of montage and associative conjunction of pictorial words that indeed has precursors, namely in the field of the so-called fine arts. Warburg himself emphatically pointed out this contamination technique and paid tribute to it as expression of a new era. In his book about Florentine art of portraiture, 1902, published, the art historian illustrates in depth, among others, Ghirlandaio's fresco in the Sassetti Chapel in Santa Trinita, that is devoted to the endorsement of the rule of the Order of St. Francis. Warburg writes, Quote, Gelandayo, by contrast, takes the spiritual content as a contrast to Giotto's fresco in the Bardi Chapel as a welcome pretext for reflecting the beauty and splendor of temporal life just as if he were still apprenticed yeah, to his goldsmith's father with the task of displaying the finest merchandise to the avid gaze of customers on the feast of St. John. Gelandayo and his patron extend the donor's traditional modus prerogative of being devoutly, devoutly present in some corner of the painting and coolly assume 
the privilege of free access to the sacred narratives as onlookers or even as participants in the action. Gelandayo's confident personages patronize the characters in the legend. This is no mindless arrogance. These are churchgoers who love life and whom the church must accept on their own terms because they are no longer prepared to be kept in a poacher of abject submission. The artist and his patron maintain the propriety they do not cross the border like an enemy patrol, but introduce their own likeness into the chapel a la Buona. With casual good humor, rather as a bizarre clan of drolleries might claim squatters rights over the margins of a medieval book of ours. End of quote. Warburg appreciates Gilandayo's repeated falsification of history, which is accomplished by the artist in exchanging Florence for Rome, history for the present and the secular for the clerical public as achievement of an epoch shaped by the requirement of a proud community of merchants. The self-confidence even ranges as far that a historic scene may be transposed to one's own town and present and thus adapted for one's own reputation reputation. This is the drawing which uh, Gelandayo changed then to put uh, the scene into the uh, Florentine uh, scale, scape. Based on this self-esteem it is finally possibly possible to transfer oneself as patron along with the court in the painting into close pro hope and the sacred events. Just if, if one belonged to his closest Entourage. One could also call this step indecent and arrogant, but Warburg finds good historical reasons for this intervention. Nevertheless, in the case of the Wandsbeck swimmer who collides with a pontifical, pontifical procession, this forbearance no, may not be exercised, although here as well, to say it with Warburg's words, a curiosity of a mostly diversified public which doesn't know the priority of picture news anymore is to be satisfied. Dispersed attention, Benjamin calls this mode of nervous perception. Benjamin might possibly have joined in Warburg's criticism when faced with the Hamburg magazine chaos. In the mid-twenties, he becomes more interested in issues and gradually transforms to an image historian whose research on the 19th century would actually have been compatible with the program of the Kulturwissenschaftliche Bibliothek and would also have completed it excellently with regard to the 19th century. Benjamin encountered encountered the afterlife of the antique in his studies in Paris at every turn and the notes and analyses are recorded in the Passagenwerk, the archives project. If Benjamin only gradually gains recognition in the role of a cultural scientific image historian, this is particularly due, particularly due to the fact that the atlas of those images with which he increasingly deals has not been compiled until today. A comp Compilation of the very frequent images which Benjamin focuses on in his writings, not least in his works on the Arcades project, whose conceptual foundations are fixed just in those years, would prove that the, the author, preferably apostrophized as philosopher, critic or writer, becomes more and more an expert of image history via his broad cultural and art historical interests, photography and film, but also popular prints in the form of caricatures, as well as commercial art in the form of advertisements, posters, stamps, shop signs or advertisements on facades come into his focus. After all, as sources for the research on the 19th century as a history of modernism, images represent a central basis for argumentation. This keen interest, however, will only become visible when the image universe quoted by Benjamin, which is hidden behind and the mountains of texts that have been piled up by editions and secondary literature, reference literature in the meantime, is being reviewed and presented. Then it would become obvious that a veritable illustrated atlas is hidden within the archives project, but not only there, which just needs to be made explicit in order to become visible. In this respect, at the end of the 1920s, Walter Benjamin and Abi Warburg could have very well been able to exchange views, not only in the field of fine arts, but also in that of trivial arts, at least in terms of the subjects. Concerning questioning and methods, they would certainly have had different opinions here and there, but this was 
Uh, a similar case, for example, with Evin Panofsky, to mention a representative of the more inner circle, Warburg inner circle. Why Warburg never took note of Benjamin remains a mystery. Benjamin's book, one explanation may be that of Horst Prede come given before Benjamin's, but I'm not quite sure whether Warburg read the book. Benjamin's book on the Trauerspiel, with its elaborate passages on Dürer's Melancholia, which pay respect to the author Warburg in several remarks, apparently remains unread on the desk before being headed as gift to Fritz Sachsel without any comment. Not even the two names, the two proper names, stand on the title page next to each other because Warburg's, the same line, Warburg. Uh, Science is short dedication with KBW, that is not as person but as institution. Nonetheless, perhaps it's possible to see this uh, book today or tomorrow and the some letters which name uh, Walter Benjamin's uh, person within the context of the Warburg Institute and its archive. Not even the two named properly sent on the title page. Yes, I told so. Nonetheless, today we know through a number of adept studies where and how the alleged oppositions meet, or rather how much these two positions belong to each other, completing one another. While Warburg is looking for the word belonging to the image, Benjamin is seeking out the image belonging to the word. Both intended in their main works, however, as Cornelia Zumbusch formulated to the point to offer enlightenment about images in images. At any rate, the two heroes of cultural scientific research have co coalesced in perception like the almost inseparable half and twin brothers Castor and Pollux. And please let me show you a silver statuette from the British Museum. Uh, Tutela Panthea, a Gallo-Roman Gallo goddess of salvation, 2nd century AD. Uh, also, to have a closer look. And you see the Dioscuri on both sides here, and looking very similar in, in within the same age, but uh, it's possible to transfer uh, aspects to Benjamin and Warburg, of course, in the play, like the almost inseparable half and twin brothers Castro and Pollux, who are eternalized in the constellation of Gemini, where the band, where the band of the Milky Way traverses its eastern part. If you allow me to conclude with a few personal words, I would like to add that this constellation has had a very inspiring effect on me since the early days of my studies and still has today in the article of Wolfgang Kemp made a pock in my inner life as a uh, young scholar in 1975. Thank you very much for your attention. <laughs> <laughs>